Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Linda Schenk. I'm the Executive Officer for Wine Communicators of Australia. Today, we'll be hearing from Craig Elliott, who is the Programs Manager for the National Xylella Preparation Pre Preparedness Program. I didn't think I'd get preparedness wrong. I thought I'd get Xylella wrong. Um, a collaborative effect between Wine Australia and the Hort Innovation uh, and Hort Innovations, and Anita Potter, who is the Corporate Affairs Manager for Wine Australia. Biosecurity is a serious issue for everybody within the wine sector, and today Craig and Anita will be sharing their knowledge of this important topic with us. As per usual, we'll be taking questions. If you think of a question throughout the presentation, please click on the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen and type away and put your questions in. We'll be answering the questions at the end of Craig's presentation and then at the end of Anita's presentation. As per usual, we'll be recording this webinar. A link will be sent to you most likely tomorrow so that you can watch the presentation again at your, um, at your convenience. It is my, now my pleasure to pass over to you to Craig. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Linda, and uh, thanks everyone for joining in here. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Program Manager for the National Xylella Preparedness Program. Um, I won't talk too much about Xylella today, but uh, certainly it's our number one uh, plant biosecurity threat, not just to the wine sector, but also to a number of other um, commodities. So Xylella itself affects over 560 60 different plant species. And uh, certainly for the, uh, the wine sector, we're, we're talking in the uh, multiple billions of dollars in terms of the impact that Zylella does actually come into the country. But today we're talking more generally about biosecurity and to start off with a bit of a um, outline of what it exactly is. And then some of the um, response arrangements and different things that are in the background that might be important to you uh, in terms of how it affects your industry. I always start off by asking people uh, or getting them to think about what would uh, it actually mean if you got that call, that call that Xylella was in the country or some sort of other pest or disease and what it would actually mean for your business, your sector, your district. And sometimes people will look at it and go, this won't really affect me, it's a disease, the government will roll in, the government will sort this. When you start thinking about some of the implications, such as the movement of products or the movement of people or vehicles, suddenly becomes restricted, supply might be cut off, the flow on effects not only become uh, fairly widespread, but also quite long term. So our first step, and certainly what I'm doing with the Zylella Preparedness Program, is talking to a lot of different, different industry sectors and governments about what their arrangements actually are and how we can get better coordination between industry, government and community make sure if that call does come in, they're actually prepared for it. So it's a, when I'm uh, training uh, people in biosecurity, I always describe it as a bucker situation. That's the bucker with a V, just in case anyone's uh, mishearing hearing me. It's something that's volatile. It can be very uncertain. It's quite complex and can be quite ambiguous as well in terms of how it actually uh, comes about and how we actually deal with the, the issues. It's a Gordian knot type situation. And for us, it's not just the biosecurity instance, it's also things like extreme weather events, whether uh, fire, flood, or drought. It's the long-term climate change that we're starting to see. Things like product contamination and substitution and adulteration are important as well. We hear once again that, um, I think it was grapes, uh, yesterday were picked up in Melbourne that had needles inserted into them. So there's all those sort of crises that can come out of left field and affect uh, a, a product or a business. Um, wine, unfortunately, is um, one of the key targets for food fraud. Uh, certainly in uh, parts of China, we hear stories of some brands having bottles refilled five, six, seven, eight times um, once they're in country by people who are substituting and adulterating the, uh, the product. So massive uh, implications from there. We've seen the, the rise of social activism, probably less so at the moment for uh, plant products uh, or plant-based products, but we see it uh, particularly in the livestock industries of how those sort of um, incidents can uh, turn into a, a major impact on the, on the business and shut down businesses. And of course, there's always the traditional competition for markets, audiences, and even resources that can make uh, running a business extremely difficult for anyone. The biosecurity incidents, though, are the, the one that we're looking at today. 
And essentially, uh, a biosecurity incident is any sort of outbreak or incursion of a pest, a disease, or a weed that has a, a, a negative impact on the, the economy, on the environment, or on social amenity. And we've just got a sample of uh, different ones there on your on the right. Uh, up the top, uh, the top left-hand uh, picture is actually a foot and mouth disease outbreak in uh, in England a bit over a decade, or probably close to 15 years ago now. That had massive impacts on not just uh, the entire economy, uh, but also on individual producers. So where we did see uh, a lot of farms and uh, be essentially no longer no longer viable and massive impacts on individuals in terms of uh, what have been generations of work to breed certain stock. The picture on the top uh, right is the, the fire ant. Anyone who's in southeast Queensland will hopefully be well and truly aware of that. It, as the name uh, suggests, uh, when it stings or bites, it, uh, it feels like fire, um, which would probably be um, tolerable if it was a single ant, but they have a tendency to swarm. So what we see in, uh, in Texas and some other places where they've um, taken hold is people can't use their backyards or certain parks because of infestation of fire ants. They can also attack uh, small animals and certainly again, the, the swarm of um, fire ants biting uh, an animal will essentially kill the, uh, kill the animal. So massive uh, game changer in how things uh, are happening uh, in Australia. Um, at the moment, it's essentially contained to southeast Queensland. There's been uh, outbreaks in Gladstone and the Port of Botany, and I think also in, in Victoria that uh, fortunately have been eradicated. But the the effort in uh, in southeast Queensland has uh, now uh, been going since about uh, 2001, and um, still uh, a little bit on a knife edge on whether they can uh, defeat it or not. In the the centre uh, pair, the one on the left is Zylola. So that's a uh, olive grove in uh, southern Italy. And um, if you do want to um, uh, have a bit of a, a scare in terms of what um, a, a bad biosecurity outbreak looks like, you, you search for Xylella in Puglia in southern Italy and what it's done to the olive groves there, where we're talking uh, tr some trees that are thousands of years old uh, are now dead. And in fact, whole groves have um, been wiped out. And on effects, of course, so not just the social dislocation and the impact on the communities, but the cost of olive oil has uh, gone through the roof, and uh, production, of course, has, has slumped in those areas. The picture on the right in the middle is myrtle rust. That's now taken hold through most of the eastern seaboard of Australia. Affects uh, what we call the matasi species. So we're thinking, you know, talking about everything from your what people commonly call gum trees or eucalypts. Uh, bottle brushes, a lot of hedge plants, ornamental plants as well. The, the host list for that is uh, almost as big as, as Zyloa. And it, it was probably our first major plant biosecurity um, issue here in Australia. And what we described essentially as a, as a landscape changer, particularly uh, as it started affecting a lot of our native plants and getting into some of our forest areas. Down the bottom left uh, is, uh, I suppose you could say that it's a happy story in terms of it's not um, diseased pigs. Um, but you will hopefully um, picked up some of the news recently about African mm. swine fever, where that um, has just been detected last week in uh, Timor-Leste. Um, and across the world, uh, it's been something like 25% of the um, uh, pig production or, or piggeries have been affected by this. It's gone through to China um, uh, fairly rapidly, and that's where the major culls, we're talking millions of pigs have had to um, be culled or have died from the, the disease. So another major game changer. Um, unfortunately, it's probably inevitable that something like that will come into Australia. Every week, the, uh, the Australian government, the, the Border Force and Department of Agriculture inspectors at the border intercept I think it's 20 to 30 shipments of, or 20 to 30 um, instances of people trying to bring pork illegally into the country. And um, something like a third of those are uh, being detected as infected with African swine fever. So with that sort of pressure on our border, um, and unfortunately with people not uh, taking it seriously, it is unfortunately a matter of time before that does uh, come into the country. And the final one, the, uh, the final uh, bad news story, which unfortunately um, biosecurity often gets equated with um, bad news, is a particular weed. That one's uh, Chilean needlegrass, which uh, you might think it will go and go, well, it's just grass, not such much 
not such a problem. But those little uh, spikes in the uh, seeds uh, at the end of the, the grass are in fact quite sharp. And uh, whilst it's annoying for people when you get them in your clothes, uh, for animals like sheep, it's um, actually caused a major animal welfare issue in that the, uh, the spikes do essentially burrow into the skin and um, cause injury to, to the animals. Uh, one of the issues with uh, biosecurity is just the absolute wealth or the diversity of different threats that we face. And uh, it is extremely hard to actually get on the front foot to actually be prepared for um, a lot of the different ones. In the plant world, there uh, has been a, a list of uh, now 42 priority pests. And Zylella is number one on that, but it includes a number of other uh, viruses and bacteria and uh, insects that do, um, do place not just the wine sector, but all our other horticultural sectors at, at risk as well. So a biosecurity incident, it, it'll have a number of direct impacts. There's uh, death and destruction or some sort of impact on, um, on the different plant hosts. And that can be uh, ranging from the actual death of the plant right through to things like reduced growth or reduced production um, on there. Uh, when we have a biosecurity incident, pretty much the first thing that happens is other areas will um, lock down their borders and uh, producers will lose access to markets. So I'm based in Tasmania, which um, we're, we're quite uh, fortunate in being an island that um, we can control our borders quite well. But when we have uh, recent outbreaks, such as um, blueberry rust or Queensland fruit fly that we've had in the past um, 12 months, we'll see our, not just our domestic markets and other states, but also our international markets will, um, will shut down access and our producers can't, um, can't then trade or uh, export to those, those markets. Obviously, that becomes a major problem when you're dealing with a, a crop that uh, may be uh, an annual harvest, because you can very, if the timing of the outbreak is at the uh, wrong time, you end up losing a, the, the equivalent of an annual, um, your annual salary or your annual um, profit straight away. And those, uh, they, they can take an um, extensive period, uh, as in more than a year, for you to regain some of that market access because once the um, outbreak is controlled and uh, eradicated, um, it takes a, a period before uh, other governments will actually trust that uh, your area is now free and it's now safe to accept your, your products. During the uh, incident itself, there will be restrictions placed on the movement of people, plants, um, all sorts of products, animals, vehicles, machinery, anything that could potentially move the biosecurity uh, threat, whether it's a, an insect or a, um, a pathogen, a disease, uh, anything that could potentially move it will be locked down and prevented from moving or only being allowed to move under certain conditions. And again, when you start thinking of um, things like rusts or bacteria, very, very easy and very hard to detect, but very, very easy for those to be transmitted. And you'll have restrictions placed on uh, anything that uh, does present a risk of moving it. The other uh, major direct impact is that you have increased production or operational costs, either that um, your plants are producing less, so you need more of them, or there'll be some sort of treatment uh, requirements, uh, fungicides or other um, treatment methods to try and reduce the, the incident of the, the pest and allow the plants to actually grow. And sometimes things that are uh, often forgotten are the flow on effects, the indirect effects, um, what inside the, the area of, of biosecurity called consequence management. And they're things like social dislocation, um, particularly uh, a property that's been infected and uh, been quarantined, it can be quite isolating for the, uh, for the family or the, the workers involved there. And unfortunately, we do, um, do hear stories or, or find evidence that properties that um, have been quarantined, the family itself, including the children, um, can be, in essence, picked on um, or neglected a little bit. Um, probably some of the worst ones I've, I've seen is during equine influenza outbreak um, about 13, 14 years ago, where we heard stories of kids at school being um, being teased and picked on uh, because their properties are being quarantined because they were infected with uh, with EI. So a, a big, um, it is a, a fairly big focus now. In the, in the past, we probably didn't put a big effort into um, supporting families. Now it's uh, certainly front and centre of the governments uh, when they respond to biosecurity. 
to make sure the, the people directly affected um, do have good support um, during the uh, during the response. Flow-on effects, of course, the loss of employment, uh, particularly for contract workers, um, whether they're say that the backpackers doing picking, or whether it's agronomists or transporters or, or other people. Uh, all of a sudden, if the source of the business um, is under quarantine, uh, they obviously then have a flow-on effect where they don't have uh, income or business either. And we often see that even uh, in the, the communities, if we have a, a long biosecurity response, you start seeing the impact even on things like the, the restaurants and cafes and, and other um, parts of the, the community will be affected by the, uh, the fact that there's a lot less money or less um, income coming through a, a business. And then the final one, important one, uh, is certainly the, the reputational damage, uh, probably less so with uh, plant uh, products. But we see it a lot in livestock industries with uh, either sale yards or studs or those sort of uh, businesses. If they've been um, infected by a particular disease, whether it's their fault or, or not, um, it creates a, a degree of concern uh, for, for others who might be uh, intending to use them in the future. So we'll move on and uh, what happens during a response? Um, there's uh, Two of my former staff, very shy, they don't like uh, their faces on camera when I was trying to um, get the pictures on it. But um, two uh, of our government response officers who uh, respond to it. And there's a couple of steps that um, happen during response. And the first one is usually a focus on trying to contain the biosecurity threat. So it's a gang, whether it's a pest or a, uh, a disease, or trying to prevent it spreading further. And part of that is also looking at what we call delimiting surveillance of exactly how far and wide this actually is. And we do that primarily through additional tracing, uh, looking at why, where plants have come from and where plants have been moved to during a, the at-risk period and doing, doing, doing surveillance around those areas to try and work out whether it's just isolated to one property or whether we're actually dealing with multiple properties and multiple regions. So working out what the scale of the response is. From there, we're looking at whether we can actually eradicate it. Unfortunately, it's not always feasible uh, to eradicate it. Something like xylella, there is no known cure to it. The only way we could eradicate it at the moment is if we uh, destroyed every infected plant. So I'll just let that uh, sink in for a second. When you think about some of our vineyards here in Australia, of what the impact would actually be of taking out some of those older vines or some of the, the heritage um, values that can actually um, be impacted. There is work for xylella being done to actually identify a potential um, treatment um, using other viruses and other um, options. But for a lot of these, the standard response is actually uh, destruction of any infected plants, as well as uh, using a buffer around those plants to uh, destroy um, other ones to make sure it doesn't uh, doesn't transmit further. And Another important part of uh, responses, again, something that's become a lot more important, not just for biosecurity responses, but you'll see this with other disasters as well, is supporting the communities that are affected to make sure they're, they're able to recover as quickly as possible. And this uh, one part of it is um, business continuity, but also looking at how um, we can start restore access to markets and other um, types of issues. And that flows into the consequence management of uh, supporting people during what is a, a pretty stressful time uh, for it for them and we, we strike this particularly um, when individuals or individual businesses might be under a degree of financial stress already things like the biosecurity incident can actually be a tipping point um, in terms of whether the, the business remains viable or not and there, there may be a need for some sort of government or industry support to uh, keep, to keep them afloat and, um, and operating during these periods so move into what our response framework actually looks like. Um, in one way, we Australia is quite fortunate. We've got a, a relatively mature um, biosecurity emergency response framework um, that a lot of other countries do look at and uh, try and emulate. Um, the downside of that is that's because we've had a lot of biosecurity outbreaks and we've developed a lot of experience in this uh, this area. And there's generally two types of biosecurity responses or two different levels. One are the deed responses, and I'll explain that in a second. And the other one are essentially your standard responses that 
pretty much do happen nearly every week. It doesn't get a lot of publicity, um, but these are our low-level responses that a, a government agency can deal with fairly simply. And we'll go in, have it under control, and uh, hopefully eradicate it um, within uh, maybe weeks or, or months. And it, it doesn't cause a lot of attention and we're able to get back to, to normal. The deep responses are the larger ones. Um, and that is where it's a um, essentially a, a nationally significant um, pest or disease that's going to have a major impact on it. And there's a, a document called the, the Emergency Plant Pest Response Deed um, that sets out the government's requirements and the cost sharing um, approach to make sure that uh, the response is funded well and coordinated quite well. And I'll cover that in, in a second. The other main part of our response framework is the uh, what we we shorten the name to Plant Plan, the emergency, the Australian Emergency Plant Pest Response Plan, and that sets out in, in greater detail. It becomes essentially the, the guidebook or the handbook of the different phases from the response, from that very first alert phase where we think we have something, through the operational phase when we're actually dealing with it, and then as we close down and um, and finalise the response. It lays out all the actions for the different parties, whether it's industry, government, and then the different roles within those uh, those sectors of what people need to do. The plan plan also uh, covers a governance and decision making uh, process for the deed responses. Um, I'll cover that in a, uh, a second of the, the detail of how that operates and uh, the role for, uh, for people in the, the wine sector. It has a lot more detail about what we call control centers. And that's, if you like, the, uh, the hub of all the activity where we'll have uh, incident controllers and other staff operating from to actually undertake the, uh, the response itself. Explains in uh, more detail exactly who does what and what their, um, their roles and tasks are. It goes into other areas such as um, laboratory and, and sampling standards, communications approach, and similar sort of things to that. I mentioned there's a decision-making framework uh, in behind a, a biosecurity response that's managed under the response D. And probably one of the key parts to it is the consultative committee. And that brings together uh, the key government officers. So if it's a, a livestock disease, it'll be the chief veterinary officer. For any sort of plant, pest or disease, it'll be the chief plant health officer of each state, plus the uh, chief plant health officer from the Australian government plus representatives from any affected industries. So if it was Xylella, we would see the chief plant health officers from every government in Australia, plus people from wine, uh, olives, um, the nursery and gardens industry, citrus, all those affected industries would be coming together for a consultative committee. And they would uh, provide advice on essentially the response strategy, on whether it's actually feasible to, um, to contain and eradicate Xylella, uh, the approach that's actually uh, going to be involved and uh, whether to go ahead with that response. That recommendation is made to the National Management Group, which essentially is the next level up of each of those representatives. So it'd be the Director Generals or Secretaries of the Government Departments involved, plus the CEOs of any of the affected industries. At that point, if they make that decision to go ahead, they'll also make a decision about the level of funding available and how any sort of cost sharing will be made. So uh, a good example might be the, the red imported fire end I mentioned earlier, where that's a cost shared response, where different governments uh, contributed money to the Queensland government to actually fund that response. And uh, reporting uh, comes back obviously from the response itself so that they know how things are traveling. So it's showed in a, uh, another way, uh, the National Management Group and the Consultative Committee set the strategic policy and direction. That's then passed over to the control centres or the coordination centres, and they actually then get on and actually do the uh, do the work itself. So that uh, diagram there on the right shows what a major outbreak uh, response would look like. So something like xylella or foot and mouth disease would see a national coordination centre set up uh, in Canberra. And that would be working across each of the states to make sure each state's operating in the same way. At the state level, you then have a, uh, a head office, if you like, uh, setting the state coordination, uh, making sure things are happening there. They would then deal with local control centres, which would be close to where the outbreak is. 
you might just have one um, or if there's multiple areas that um, are infested you might have multiple uh, control centers actually there that's where the uh, you see the, uh, the staff on the ground heading out from and then forward command posts might be on infected premises itself or at particular key areas to actually have that direct contact with the, uh, the community that's uh, that's infected the, uh, the photos on the, the right are from a, a couple of responses. Um, if you do ever get involved in there or you get to tour through a control centre, um, you'll see uh, some people wearing the, uh, what we call the tabards, they're the, the little vests there and down the bottom, you see a, an incident controller. So they would be essentially the, the boss, the, 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 uh, the person who um, ends up with most of the responsibility and make sure everything's happening. And then others uh, have different functional roles, which I'll cover in a second as well. The, the control centers can vary quite a lot depending on the, the state uh, and the uh, level of resourcing that they have. Some areas have the uh, um, what you'd expect to see um, based on your experience from, from movies where you see lots of screens and TVs and desks set up, um, a very um, professional looking outfit. Uh, other states or so other areas, sometimes they don't have those resources. So I guess you'd see uh, more like the bottom one with a lot more whiteboards and um, pieces of paper tacked up on, on walls as they try and manage the, the response. So, as I said, the, uh, the picture on the right of the diagram on the right showed uh, a, a major event. If it was something that was a little bit smaller, we wouldn't have a national coordination centre. So, for example, some of the recent outbreaks here in Tasmania, uh, we haven't needed a national coordination centre. We'd have a state coordination centre reporting to the agency executives and then local control centres and forward command posts in place. If we had something very, very minor, we might not even stand up a, a state centre. We just have a local control centre in a, a local government office and uh, whatever forward command posts they actually need. So one of the very good things about the system that we've got is it's extremely flexible and very scalable. So if something might actually start out as something that uh, is considered just a, a local control centre issue, under control fairly easy, if something uh, went wrong or it suddenly became a lot larger, it can be stepped up to a state one or then if it got picked up in multiple states, it can uh, turn into a, a national uh, coordination center and uh, step up a, as needed. So I mentioned uh, if you do see a control center um, that you'll see a lot of people wearing different uh, tabards and they're all color coded. The idea being that as you walk into a control center, if you know you need to talk to the public information, uh, team, they'll be there wearing uh, what's actually a brownish colour rather than orange, and you can identify them quite easily. So each of those areas, the uh, public information, planning, operations, logistics, finance and admin, and liaison, all have particular roles there. You might remember I said earlier that everyone has a has a job card in there. So the incident controller is essentially the person who where the buck stops. They're there to make sure that everyone's functioning, everyone's focused on the outcome and that works uh, continuing on as needed. Public info is as you expect. It's the contact with the information uh, going out to the, uh, to the public and affected communities. Planning are uh, looking ahead of uh, what's meant to be happening the next day, the next week, in the next three months, and what sort of uh, resources are going to be needed. The operations group, uh, we're, we're red, and that's where the, the rubber, rubber hits the road, and they're the ones who are actually out there doing surveillance and destruction and decontamination. Logistics, uh, essentially the, the ones who, um, you, you always make sure you look after them, because they're the ones who make sure you have a bed and food at night, um, and that there's vehicles and other equipment, uh, everything that's needed is, uh, is available. And then the background, uh, finance and admin, sometimes forgotten, but they're the ones who uh, probably become important after the event when we're trying to work out how much money was spent or who was working where. They look after the records and, uh, and the payments. The liaison function is a relatively new one. It's um, something that we're trying to emphasize a lot more. And that is uh, an extent, originally an extension of public info. Uh, but now we look at it a lot more about they're working with us, one, to get the message out to the industries and communities that are affected but also give us feedback and input into some of our planning. So they're most likely not people from, uh, from a government biosecurity agency. There are mm -hmm. people from the industry itself and they're there with uh, good contacts and good local knowledge to, uh, to help us. So put it a, another way or a simple way, the planning thinks, 
logistics gets, operations does the work, public information tells everyone, finance and admin can pay and record what's happening, and the incident control coordinates and commands what, uh, what happens. All of this work uh, is essentially the same as how you would see it in a major bushfire or a major public safety event. There's very, very similar systems in place across all the different emergency response agencies now. So something I thought uh, would be of interest uh, to this group was certainly the, the role of uh, public information in a control, control centre. And they've got a number of um, key activities. One obviously is, is media li liaison, so setting up um, uh, opportunities for interviews to explain what's happening, developing the media releases, supporting our spokespeople, and dealing with any of those media inquiries that, uh, that come in. They also look after our social media and online uh, communications to make sure that uh, one we're putting information out through those but also very importantly that we, uh, we've discovered is actually monitoring what's uh, happening there in the online space and identifying where there's any rumors or misinformation going out um, it's a, a tendency that we, we find that in the absence of information uh, people will fill it whether it's uh, with accurate information or not and of course we do get people who um, head off on their own tangent or have their own agenda who will push out uh, information, whether it's accurate or not, that we, we do need to counter. We often have uh, call centres or hotlines set up. The public information centre, uh, public information function will uh, will get that started. And quite often we'll actually contract that out to professional call centres. Uh, obviously not uh, not all governments do have call centres uh, in-house. In and we'll uh, look at how uh, we can manage that if we do have a, a large outbreak and potentially a lot of inquiries coming in. They also develop the, the standard information, uh, the various fact sheets and information uh, material that we need to explain what's going on. And they also support the liaison officers in terms of what information they need and helping them uh, sort out the issues for the, the industry itself. There is, uh, in the background, and this, uh, this document is uh, publicly available uh, through the Department of Agriculture website. Um, a public information manual that we developed, um, or the original version was in 2016 that we updated it last year and it provides a, a general overview of what, how the uh, public info function operates and what they do but also got a lot of templates and forms in there. The idea of a lot of our preparedness activities obviously is to try and have things ready to go so that as the uh, outbreak itself happens we're able to start pushing information out as, as quickly as possible. We don't have a lag time of, um, of days or even weeks um, in terms of getting information out. A couple of points uh, just about biosecurity. Um, if you're working with um, uh, your clients or you're uh, employed by a, a winery or a vineyard, some of the things that we really try to push and we try and get this um, concept of biosecurity being just part of normal business. So as workers are out in the vineyards, they should be looking for anything unusual. Um, managing entry to areas, you might have a clean and dirty area where all visitors are contained to a certain area um, in a, a parking lot or a hard, hard stand area before they're allowed into the production areas and they're checked before they go in, make sure they're not carrying any potential diseases or seeds or anything like that. I'm certainly pushing a, a lot in the Xylella program with the uh, nurseries and gardens industry to make sure you actually trust your suppliers or you, you know you can trust your suppliers and there's some traceability there that uh, they do have good biosecurity hygiene in their premises and what uh, they're selling you or putting onto your property isn't actually um, a high risk uh, um, product. A, a good or, or bad, depending on where you sat. sat. Uh, example of this was during a blueberry rush response here in Tasmania about four years ago where two growers um, didn't have good biosecurity, bought some infected blueberry plants and put them straight in the middle of their uh, their orchards. Both those properties were completely removed of uh, blueberry plants and put both businesses um, out of uh, out of business, unfortunately, uh, due to the, the, the poor biosecurity that they had in place. Uh, moving on, we, uh, we encourage people to, to train their staff and, uh, and prompt them to, one, recognise what potential biosecurity threats are and then what they need to do if they see a problem, whether it's a contractor turning up with a contaminated um, machinery or something simple like having uh, up in the packing shed or a, a meal room or something like that, uh, photos of what the key threats are 
um, key insects or other symptoms of disease that they should be watching out for. And the final point we encourage people to do is to have some contingency planning in place, both in terms of what would happen to the, uh, to the business operations, of if the disease appeared, what's the steps the staff need to do, uh, what increased uh, decontamination levels or access restrictions they need to have in place, and then what they're going to communicate out to their stakeholders, both their, their clients, but also their suppliers and their employee, employees and the general community of letting them know what's happening and what uh, what other people need to do. That's, that can be a very difficult area. And it's one we always uh, suggest that people get advice on because if uh, you jump the gun a little bit too early, there could be some fairly major vice, uh, market access issues for there. We know certainly, um, and we've seen it on a number of occasions. Uh, overseas governments are actually watching um, a lot of the social media and other information that is uh, coming out of both individual enterprises, but also governments. And uh, again, a good example is the Queensland fruit fly outbreak in Tasmania, where we started at that stage, I was still working for the government. Uh, we started getting inquiries from two overseas countries about what was actually happening before we'd officially released um, the information that we were uh, infested. So as I said, they are watching for um, signs of unusual activity or commentary inside um, social media and elsewhere to try and protect themselves. So if you do spot something unusual, who are you going to call? The, the first part or the, the main one is there is a, um, a single hotline number, the, the 1800 to 084 881 number. Depending on where you are, they'll direct you to the, uh, the relevant state government um, office where you can actually um, let them know that you've spotted something unusual. And we always say it's, um, it's better to be safe than sorry. And the, the Australian government ran a um, program, uh, or a media program not, uh, not too long ago, basically called Don't Be Sorry. If you think that they've got something um, that's a bit unusual, it's better to get it checked than uh, find out uh, a week or two later that you've um, caused a, a major disease um, outbreak spread over a large area. So one of the other important things about not delaying is um, it can affect the ability of the, um, the response to contain it and eradicate the disease. And it can also limit any available owner cost reimbursements. So under the cost sharing of deeds, there can be some reimbursements to owners who have suffered a financial impact. But if there's been a delay in actually reporting it, that, um, that can be restricted or um, even um, cut off completely. So once you've uh, got something, start activating your, um, your, your incident plan for your aid of the organisation and considering the, uh, the public and stakeholder communications. As I said, you, you do need to be careful there and I'd, I'd seek guidance from your, uh, your government uh, contact if, um, if you're putting anything out, just to make sure you're not going to um, cause a major uh, international trade issue. And a very quick uh, process or structure that um, I always uh, train the, the government officers on. In terms of your communications plan, there's four key points. You need to tell people what you, you know, in terms of what's happening, uh, what you don't know. Quite often, the, it's said with biosecurity, there's a lot of um, uncertainty and ambiguity in terms of what's happening and how it's going to be managed, uh, what you're doing yourself, and then anything you want other people to do. It might be something as simple as, we don't want people to come visit this property at the moment until we have it under control. There is potential for you to be involved in a biosecurity response. I know um, certainly the, the public information section, the, um, I do a lot of work still with the, the various governments uh, there, and in particular the staff who become uh, public information managers. And they are always looking for experienced people to come in and, and help them. So if you do get involved, um, and I certainly recommend that if you ever get the opportunity to go to a, um, an industry um, meeting about biosecurity, um, do that and see if you make some of these contacts. But if you do get involved, plan for the long game. And this is something um, that unfortunately we, we seem to have to repeat a, a lot of times that a biosecurity response is very rarely uh, something that's over in a day or two. Um, staff who get engaged in this um, will be engaged for, for literally months. And the, I will leave the nodal rust response in Queensland and uh, I can tell you, I, I certainly remember making the mistake of entering the phone on Boxing Day in 2010. And for the next three months, I was rarely home. So for three months, I was almost continuously working in, in Brisbane. And uh, it's one of those things that you have to actually make sure you pace yourself a little bit 
and the people around you to make sure you don't burn out very, very uh, quickly. Uh, bearing in mind after that three months, um, it actually went for another six months uh, onwards from uh, from there. I was diverted to some other biosecurity responses, but other staff were still working on it for much longer after that. Uh, there is always a plan for how the government agency will manage the response um, that will link into the plant plan that I mentioned earlier, but it can be extremely chaotic and even confusing at times. There are times where you think you might have it under control and then uh, a new detection will pop up and all your plans have to be turned upside down and, and rejigged to manage the fact that you're dealing with extra infected premises or, uh, or larger areas or even new plant hosts sometimes will, uh, will come into the mix. It will be stressful, um, both for the, uh, the the responders inside the control centres, as well as for the industry um, affected. That can uh, be manifested in a lot of different ways, but obviously people react to stress in different ways, and it can be um, a, a source of a fair bit of conflict, both within local communities, but also within organisations. It's important to look after your welfare, both in terms of it could be uh, an extended period that you're involved in um, managing the effects of the response, but also the stress of it. And uh, again, this is something which um, we're putting a lot of emphasis on in terms of our response agencies and staff involved there. Particularly if there's sometimes, as we uh, we do in uh, in Northern Territory and Queensland, have back-to-back -back responses going where people don't have a lot of downtime to, um, to relax in between their responses. And for you, um, there will be a dedicated section uh, within a control centre that if you do need to work with or you do need um, some support or some advice or information that you can go to. As I said, uh, there'll be a liaison officer in a public information uh, section that will be uh, in place for the, uh, for the industry to work with. And finally, um, it can be very rewarding. Uh, people often ask me why I stay involved in biosecurity responses. It can be because you see a, a, it's important work, obviously, to protect our, uh, our economy and environment, but you can actually see a very good outcome come uh, through what, uh, what happens. Uh, as I said, it can be a very long road to, uh, to get to those, but um, at the end of it, we're, we're doing fairly important work to um, make sure people can enjoy um, the environment and also protect our, our economies. So I'll hand over to Anita now. Uh, who will talk a little bit more about the, the wine sector and the crisis response uh, model or plan that's in place. Have you, Anita? Okay. Thanks for that, Craig. We're um, really lucky to have Craig on board um, to prepare the Xylella response because of his practical experience. Um, what I wanted to share with you today, and um, because of this mode of communication, I've got less idea of who's out there and and your skill set and your interests than I would normally have um, in a face-to-face -face encounter. So forgive me if I'm, uh, you feel that you're going through 101 at um, any point because I'm trying to provide as much information as I can. So um, Craig, if you could just, um, the idea today is to talk about, um, from my point of view, what we have in place for the whole sector um, should a response be needed. Obviously, as Craig has emphasised numerous times, um, these things are never going to come at a convenient time. So you've got to plan in advance. So what we've done for the grape and wine sector, we've set up um, kind of a high level approach to deal with what we think are the key potential threats. And Craig has spoken specifically about biosecurity, but the other threats to our sector in terms of crisis management, uh, threats to trade access, um, if there's any particular country, and given our focus at the moment with one third of our exports going in one particular direction, you can understand how any particular threat um, at that nation would make it very difficult for the sector um, should we lose a potential market um, that comprises such a large amount of our exports. Um, the other issue is uh, a potential contaminant, which could be both a domestic and abroad, um, might be something that goes internationally as well. And when we talk about a broad scale contaminant, we don't mean an incident that happens um, and affects an individual winery, although uh, Wine Australia 
because of that fourth element, Wine Australia is there to help you if you are in dire straits and we can provide advice and point you in the right direction. But we're talking about broad scale contaminants. There's a couple of things that could potentially occur. These days, um, many people, it's much easier to get your bottling done off site. So if something goes wrong at a major contract bottling operation, it could be that multiple um, enterprises are affected um, and it could be across states with some of the mobile bottling operations um, that people could be affected because they're putting all their gear through the same contractor and therefore unrelated, numerous unrelated wineries could be affected by something that's happened on the production line. We've had uh, recent, within the past 18 months, instances where the failure of a particular machine on the production line has caused lips on bottles um, to be slightly damaged um, and the glass to go into the bottle. Fortunately, that was a single enterprise, but that made us think what happens if that had been a contractor and they had multiple production runs going through that enterprise, it could have been um, much more um, broad based. The other is damage to reputation. Um, and that may be caused by any of the three preceding ones, or it could be a reputation threat, um, which doesn't actually encompass any of those. An example would be that in a particular region, and this again is drawn from reality, a particular region experienced a problem within the past 18 months where um, a kangaroo shooter spoke to the media um, for reason A, but happened to mention along the way that um, he was contracted by a number of wineries in this particular region to shoot kangaroos, which were um, consuming all the grapes. Um, that story, thanks to social media, gained a bit of um, profile and that particular region was put under intense pressure by a number of animal uh, welfare lobby groups and that could have easily spread given that kangaroos are not just an issue in one particular region of Australia but right across the regions. Um, fortunately we were able to contain that but that kind of reputation threat where people um, in an important market decided um, as the wool industry experienced many years ago that um, due to a particular um, production operation that they did on farm, um, using sheep to prevent blowfly strike, um, a lot of animal welfare agencies started to um, campaign against um, Australian wool because they said um, it was produced in ways that were cruel. Similarly, you could imagine something like that would spread from um, shooting kangaroos in one region to threats not to drink Australian wine because we killed kangaroos. So that kind of reputation threat, um, while not based on a contaminant or a biosecurity issue, could equally have a significant impact on industry. So we've set up so that we could handle each of those particular threats. Craig, if you flick through to the next slide for me. Um, I'll sort of deal with those threats and how we plan to approach them. This is really high level for everyone out there. It's so you know about it, um, so that in the event that we have to engage with people because one of these things happen, that you know that there's a process in place. Um, if all goes well, none of you will ever have to deal with it, and I'll not have to deal with it, but you've got a plan to deal with it. So if a biosecurity um, threat arises, um, what Well, dealing more broadly than that, um, as I mentioned before, any particular crises must be broad based. Um, the team that actually assess, assesses whether it's broad based is basically the senior executive of um, Wine Australia and AGW. They will look at what comes to what's referred to them and decide whether it is a sufficient threat to set up a, a crisis management team. Um, the risk assessment team 
um, can draw on external expertise, for example, AWRI, it may be one of the universities or the CSIRO, depending on the nature of the threat. Um, certainly a couple of years ago, there was, I wouldn't call it a trade issue, but there was an issue that a particular um, export destination um, changed its um, MRL levels for a particular um, mineral for um, manganese, for manganese. And then we discovered that we had to all run around and figure out how much of it there was in our wines. Um, so AWRI stepped to the fore at that time and was very engaged in working out what our base levels were while Wine Australia um, and the, the government negotiated with that country um, at a much higher level. So the risk assessment team in assessing the threat and figuring out how to address the threat can um, seek external expertise. Craig, if you go on to the next slide, I'll just talk to you about um, what we would do in terms of biosecurity. With biosecurity process, um, threat, there's, we would look to the plant health teams to actually lead that Whereas from um, Wine Australia and Australian Grape and Wine, we would actually look at trade and reputation. As Craig said earlier, um, when there is a biosecurity threat, quite often um, trade controls are slapped on to protect importing countries. With wine, that is less likely because it is a manufactured product. However, we're aware that there may, may be trade implications because of whatever the, the biosecurity um, trigger is. Um, more importantly, reputation will become very important. Um, how we manage that whole public information process and how we deal with the situation internationally. One of the things that um, people like Craig who've worked in the sector and others who observe crises, recovery in many, many cases is either made much more difficult or is assisted by the way that reputation is actually managed during the crises. So for us, managing reputation through a biosecurity crisis becomes very important and it would also be in the instance of biosecurity, Australian Grape and Wine are very much the key agency in this and they would lead responses, whereas a Wine Australia would provide support in that case rather than leading responses. In the area of trade, we've got a lot of good contracts that we've at Wine Australia have developed over the years. So that would be critical and being able to go and talk to the right people and lobby the right people um, to ensure trade channels remained open. In terms of reputation, obviously um, myself and the team I work with and the people at AGW would be instrumental in making sure that that information that is both rooted domestically and internationally remains on message, that we continue to provide solid information and keep people up to date. So as Craig said, so that people don't invent things for themselves because that can, winding stuff back um, where speculation has taken place or where misinformation has um, been put on the table is actually much harder than making sure that you've got accurate information flowing in the first place. So in terms of biosecurity, the role for Wine Australia is very much to allow the plant health experts to lead the process and as Craig has already described, the assessment and containment process, whereas we would focus very much on trade and reputation. So moving right along, Craig. If you could go to the next slide, Craig. Okay. So in the event of a grape and wine sector trade crisis, we would work closely with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in dealing with that because they have um, basically uh, what they call desks, but I call offices um, in various countries. And those people know the right people in those government agencies to talk to. So we would work very closely with them. Also, as I've mentioned before, you, we might have a trade crisis that's actually based on um, a particular um, uh, 
mineral or it could be a chemical that's used in Australia. Um, for example, if Europe was to slap um, controls on glyphosate use within Europe and then introduce MRLs for glyphosate, we'd have to do a lot of lot more analyses because um, to date we've only done um, you know very low levels of random sampling in Australian wines for glyphosate because it's so rarely found. We might have to change the way we approach that. We might have to change what we have to do to ask people when they give us their lab certificates and the tests that must be undertaken before wines can be exported. So that's the kind of thing that we imagine ourselves doing in the event of a trade crisis. The other obvious one that um, we are very conscious of is a Australia's alignment with other uh, defence or trade partners. Things may change and we find that two different trade partners um, come are at loggerheads and that Australia becomes, um, unfortunately, ends up sitting most uncomfortably on the, set, on the fence or even worse, falls off the fence um, and then loses uh, trade access. So we see that as a very important role um, for us to engage um, if should that event happen. Um, moving to the next step, um, contaminant crises. In this case, um, we'd be dealing with both government health agencies. They actually, as Craig has described, the biosecurity process in the case of uh, health crises, there are government health agencies and they have a very similar um, process in terms of managing national incidents and state-based incidents um, and stepping things up the line. For us, it would be dealing with government trade agencies in case there were health potential. Um, some of the things we've looked at was what if something was discovered here? Again, going back to that broken glass in bottle, um, what if we had a um, contract processing facility and glass had got into the bottle? Um, it's discovered domestically, but there is um, there's product um, already en route to international markets or already in international markets that's been affected. How would we go about um, dealing with that situation? both domestically and internationally. And again, very much um, keeping in mind that how we handle the situation um, could have long-term impacts on reputation. Um, Australian wine has a, a very good reputation internationally for being safe and reliable. And anything that puts that at risk needs to be dealt with very seriously. And again, we are very much aware of the way we the fact that the way we handle a crisis will actually contribute to how we recover from that. So reputation management right the way through is critical in this aspect. And again, it would be Wine Australia working with Australian Grape and Wine to manage those issues together. Um, over to the next slide. Thank you, Craig. Just skip to them. Yeah, here we go. So we would be, one of the things that we would be dealing with is to look both media, both domestic and international. And um, I haven't separated it out, but social media very much comes into that. Um, I recently went to a presentation about social media and they were telling us about the fact that in the US um, there was a recent incident at an airport where um, there were problems with a plane and one of the engines caught fire as it was landing. It was a major international airline. Um, there was stuff trending on social within two minutes of that plane landing. So people had seen it, filmed it, um, uploaded it. It was 30 minutes before the advice got from the airport to that company's head office, which was in another country. I thought 30 minutes was pretty impressive. But by that stage, there were millions of hits on that vision. So they were playing catch up. So we're very much aware of the fact that 
social media can really drive people's um, impression of how things are being dealt with and also the information that's getting to the public. So we have plans in place how we would hand, handle things both domestically and internationally. If you could move on, Craig, excuse me. <coughs> now I've put this slide in there just to see how good your eyesight is. Actually, that's not true. The slide's in there just so you know that there is actually a process in place, um, should we need it, and that we have various, um, we've got various steps in place and how we would escalate things. Please don't try and read the slide. You'll go nuts and you'll go blind. But um, the idea is to convey that we do have a process in place. We are thinking these things through as things develop and we watch international markets as things develop. We look at things and go, oh, how would we handle that here? What should we do? Taking a step back to um, what would happen if you were the, the person who was impacted, bear in mind what Craig said earlier. If there is a potential risk, it's best to identify it very early rather than to, um, to let it drag on. And it's... It's hard to under or hard to overstate how important it is that individuals step up and take responsibility. The fire ant case, and you can correct me, Craig, but the fire ant case actually started with some individuals um, identifying something not quite right about the little beasties in their backyard. Um, uh, the other thing that I'd like to emphasise before closing is that both. Um, as you've seen from the way we plan to approach uh, a sector-wide crisis, but also when you are dealing with it as an individual business, you need to be aware that you need to have two hands to do this job. You need some people who are dealing with the immediate issues and being inward focused on how to, what to do and the logistics of it. You need people who are outward focused as well. And unless you're a very small operation, you're going to find that it's easier to split the jobs rather than to do both. You may have someone who coordinates both, but for someone to deal both with your customers, are we going to get supply next year? And also figure out, are we actually going to have to rip out that vineyard or no? It's very difficult to do both. So where you've got capacity, do think about how you will separate those from who are dealing with things that are outward focused and managing reputation and those who have to actually deal with the logistics of managing the crises itself. And that applies from having to evacuate your place if you've got a bushfire through to dealing with a biosecurity incident. So please step back and think about a crisis because when it happens, you won't have time to think. So it's best to think in advance. Um, I think we're ready to take questions. Awesome. So if anybody has any questions, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to type away in there. Um, um, I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> In those um, in those books that you were uh, presenting or showing before, do they have like um, templates and all sorts of things for people to follow, and they could put like people's names next to who would look after what, you know, within their own business? Can that can they use that as a tool? Yeah, they they can. Uh, the, the, um, the public information manual um, does have that in the in the templates and uh, certain some action plans and strategies in there. The other ones like Plant Plan, no, um, and, and that's publicly available as well. Um, if you uh, want to uh, read it, I'll, I'll forewarn you. I think it's about four or 500 pages long. Um, but yeah, there is other uh, material out there, and that, that's something certainly if you want to um, contact Anita or I, I can, um, I can certainly uh, point you in the direction of it. Things such as biosecurity planning, there's a, a, a lot of information out there, particularly through Plant Health Australia. Um, they can help with some of those sort of um, uh, action plans and things like that that can help uh, guide you through the process. Great. Thank you. Uh, look, we haven't had any questions come through and we are a little bit over time. So I'll, I might uh, 
um, close the session. But thank you so much to both Craig and Anita for your presentation today. Biosecurity is such an important issue um, and we hope that we never ever have to actually have anyone we know go through, go through some of the um, uh, atrocities that have happened in some of the other countries of the world. Um, our next webinar for Wine Communicators of Australia will be held on the 12th of November, uh, where we'll be hearing from Meltwater, a much different topic. It's all about social media and the potential of social media in the Chinese um, market. So please uh, come along to that. Uh, until then, have a great month and we will see you in November. Bye for now.